And I'm actually uh, going to be recording this session, just started recording this session now. So we will uh, re-record that session and post it on our YouTube channel, as well as share the slides on the first and second part in the series. And that will be up, um, the slides will be up in about a day. The recording will probably be a better part of a week before they get it up there. So the second part today is on airflow. We'll be covering that today. The importance of airflow is one of the key measurements in system performance. Part three, which will be going over, uh, it's a July 5th, is the live webinar at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to sign up for that, uh, it'll be covering the importance of refrigerant charge, uh, how to determine what the correct charge is, make the measurements, and setting the proper refrigerant charge, as well as uh, an emphasis on uh, the evacuation process, which is all these steps are critical to get the highest system efficiency from the equipment. Then part four we'll be covering is capacity testing a simple, uh, basically a three-step test to measure uh, the system capacity and actually calculate system capacity in cooling tons so you can really get an idea of what's what's going on. Since we do sell the equipment uh, in the AC industry uh, based on cooling tons, uh, we really should learn a proper, we, we do have a proper way of showing the tools and techniques to actually measure that. Uh, as we go through the course of today's uh, session, uh, feel free to type a question into the question box um, or raise your hand. Uh, I'm going to keep everyone on mute because that seems to work better, generally speaking, with background noise. Um, and I'm just reading one question here. apologize. Uh, okay. So, yeah, we will, we will get the slides out there. Someone's asking for the slides from last time. So why do we measure airflow? Um, we generate a lot of interest just for this little session here with just a little bit of publicity on it. Um, so it, it must be an important topic. It's a topic that's obviously on your mind that people are here today. Uh, one way of thinking of it from like a scientific or engineering perspective is that it's the airflow is the heat and energy or energy transfer medium. It's the way we transfer heat and or energy in a large part of our air conditioning uh, and ventilation systems. And in order to make it an effective way of transferring that heat or energy, we need to have the right amount of air, which in this case amounts to the right mass of air, in the right place at the right time with the correct temperature and humidity. That's basically what we're trying to deliver is the correct airflow to generate comfor comfortable conditions or necessary process conditions sometimes uh, for, uh, for the air conditioning system to generate. And it happens to be really one of two things that you can effectively adjust in an air conditioning system. Uh, we're talking outside of the realm of having it sized correctly, installed properly, and maintained. Really, this is one of the two adjustments to tune the system to fit the load that's going, going through the system. Also, it's popular. Everyone's talking about it. There's committees being formed. Uh, there's new, there are new products coming out. It seems to be the topic in a lot of different sessions uh, that I've been attending in the HVAC and en energy industry, energy auditing industry. So it, it is a very popular topic. It is being covered in some of the new DOE standards for Energy Star. And if you get it wrong, someone's going to be unhappy, either shortly or in the long run, and we don't want unhappy people. So we're going to try to work here to get the correct airflow setting as part of this whole system of delivering comfortable, efficient, and economical heating and cooling. One thing I did want to cover at the outset was what is an anemometer and also just even the correct pronunciation for the word. The anemometer comes from the word Greek animos, which means the wind. So these are basically wind meters. So if you pronounce it there to yourself, anemometer, that's the way you pronounce that word. Excuse me, one second. Got to apologize, I'm coming off of a, of a cold and some laryngitis here. So we do want to talk about some of the, the air facts, or the facts about air. Even though you can't see it, air does have mass. There is a specific or a weight to the air, standard air, which means it's 0% relative humidity, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, basically atmospheric pressure of 14.69 uh, pounds per square inch. Air 
has a weight, a standard weight of 0 0.075 pounds per cubic foot. And we did talk about the fact that it has a mass or a weight, and that's basically how the air transfers the heat or the energy is through that mass or weight. And also air does take up space. It can be compressed, but it does take up space. And the key point we want to drive home in the way we're looking at things here is we're not really conditioning CFMs of air, cubic feet of air, but really conditioning pounds of air. If you change your thinking along those lines, it's going to change some of your perspective on the process. So I just threw a term out there. What's the CFM? It's not fair to throw a term out without explaining what that term means. It's basically a cubic feet or cubic feet of uh, air flowing per minute. So it's a volume flow rate. One way of thinking about it, it's how much air per minute how much mass of air is moving, or how what the excuse, excuse me, the volume of air that's moving. Uh, it is derived from or developed from a measurement, and the measurement you take would be the velocity measurement as well as an area measurement. This is one way with a lot of the anemometers that are used. There are other devices like capture hoods that allow you to measure. Only take it'll it'll actually report back to you the CFM. Um, most typically, you're using an air velocity meter or an anemometer to make the measurement. And so we'll be talking about the combination of velocity measurements and area measurements and how to get CFM. Another way to think about it is we're talking about cubic feet or a volume flow rate. It's like boxes of air, cubic boxes of air per minute that are flowing. And again, taking your mind into that space and, and understanding that you're, you're moving masses of air in different volumes through the system uh, can sometimes change your frame of reference. And in calculating CFM, first you have to have an accurate air velocity or air speed measurement, and it's usually in feet per minute. Uh, you can use other units of measurement, of course, but uh, we're talk we'll be talking in this uh, session about feet per minute. Because then you could then multiply that feet per minute or the air velocity or speed by the cross-sectional area to get the cubic feet per minute and understand what those cubes of air, how many of those are moving through the system. An important point to keep in mind, if the air velocity measurement is incorrect, the CFM is also going to be incorrect. There's no way of doing another calculation to correct it, but it's only as good as the air velocity measurement you're making. So that's uh, one, one key point to keep in mind. I thought it would be important here to cover um, some of the techniques as we go through this uh, discussion on airflow. And we're using an anemometer or an airspeed indicator, an airspeed meter, air velocity meter to measure um, volume flow or cubic feet per minute, you do have to account for the fact um, that you're not always measuring on a supply. It's very difficult to actually know the exact open area that things are flowing through. You can easily calculate or determine the total area. That would be the area basically of the duct, but then you have the impact of the grill covering the duct. Um, and even when this grill is open, it's going to have an impact on how much air can get through that. So your total open area is really only a portion of the total area. So this open area, we, we call it a K factor or a multiplier as to how much open area is available across this total area behind it. The total area is basically the dimension of the duct behind here, but then there's an open area through which the air actually flows. And if you're scanning across this with an air velocity meter or an anemometer, you're only going to be picking up airflow in the areas where it is flowing. It's going to be blocked in some of those areas. So only 75% of the area is open. So to calculate the open area or the area through which the air is actually flowing, you need to take the total area and multiply by the K factor. The K factors can often be found in the manufacturer's uh, data, uh, data sheets for grills. Um, we found that uh, there are, there's some consistency to it. Uh, most grills are running around 0.75, but you can find some as low as 0.5 and some as high as 0.80 in terms of the open area, the percentage open area. So taking this to the next step here is uh, the open area is we, we've calculated this 4 by 10 total area. We've measured it with a tape measure 4 by 10 inches. So that gives us 40 square inches. And some of the meters, you can actually input the square inches, and it will do the internal calculation into square feet. But if it doesn't, then you'll have to convert this from 40 
to 0.28 square feet. And you do that by dividing by 144. That's the number of square inches in a square foot. Then take that total area, multiply by the K factor. In this case, we're saying it's 0.75. So your 40 square inches times 0.75 would give you 30 square inches of open area or 0.21 square feet of open area. Now, if we take that open area, 30 square inches or 0.21 square feet, and multiply by the velocity in feet per minute, say we measured an average velocity across that that grill surface, we measured an average velocity across here of 200 feet per minute, then we take that 0.21, which is the open area, up here the open area is 0.21, times the 200 feet per minute to get 42 cubic feet per minute. And that would be the airflow through this register shown here. If we were measuring an average velocity of 200 feet per minute with this kind of K factor, you would have an actual velocity, an actual airflow or volume flow of 42 cubic feet per minute. We do want to realize here that uh, air has a specific volume. If air is heated or humidified, its specific volume increases and its density decreases. That's why adding humidity to the air, like in the clouds where the humidity is actually visible, clouds rise, clouds are, you know, float higher because it's, they have a lesser density because the humidity is added. Sometimes that's counterintuitive. It's really a hard concept to grasp because you're probably more used to the fact of thinking you add water to a cloth or a rag or, or clothing and it gets heavier because it takes on that mass. But in the case of water vapor, it actually displaces the air molecules and causes it to be lighter. So the specific volume, the, the space that the air takes up, changes as it's heated or humidified. And as we said a couple minutes ago, airflow is one of the two adjustable parameters on an air conditioning or refrigeration system. And we all realize airflow is critical to proper operation in order to get the, the conditioned air to the space um, to actually to get it, uh, the humidity removed or the, uh, uh, the temperature dropped or temperature, uh, temperature increased on the, the air, you have to have the proper airflow, the proper cubic feet per minute flowing through the system. <clears throat> and in an air conditioning system, it's a parameter that must, must be uh, measured or, or set or adjusted before you set the charge, the amount of refrigerant charge in the system. If you don't set the airflow first and you're adjusting charge, you really are wandering down a, a nameless path. That's not the way to do it. Also, system capacity can be directly affected by the changes in, by changes in airflow. And that means how, how much the system is able to convert, you know, to dehumidify, to cool, or to heat the air can be directly affected by changes in airflow. So that's where really you think about the maintenance factors come into play here. Uh, if you're not maintaining the system and filters are getting dirty and you're choking down airflow, then you can affect the system capacity the way it performs. You can get a, uh, a blocked or a frozen coil. Uh, you can just get overall poor performance, poor dehumidification, etc. Going back to uh, when the Government Energy Star program was looking at uh, a central air conditioner or air source heat pump specification for uh, using the Energy Star label. There are some studies that were done on refrigerant charge and on refrigerant, uh, excuse me, and air conditioning airflow. And a quick uh, snapshot of part of that study from 2006 showed that in this, the, uh, the systems that were studied, 70% of them operated at less than 350 CF, CFM per ton. Less than 350 cubic feet per minute per ton of cooling is where these systems are operating. Where is the ideal or the, the ballpark or the beginning point for most systems is 400 CFM, except in dry climates. 70% um, of the systems were less than 350. Um, it was calculated at that point that a savings of um, energy or efficiency of about 8% was possible by getting those into spec. So the bottom line here is 70% of systems, when examined in this this uh, survey, showed to be off by uh, to be to have the incorrect airflow setting. So that's one of the reasons why we're talking about airflow is because so many systems do in fact have an incorrect airflow setting. We also want to cover um, 
there, there are various means and ways of measuring airflow. And we talk about appropriate accuracy. That's the key to useful measurements. You, you're taking a measurement for a reading to, or for a reason to understand where a system's performing. And some of those reasons might be that you're trying to prove that the system operates as the manufacturer intended. You may be actually be doing a capacity test and measuring the, the BTUH or the cooling tons. You may want to uh, develop a place or a starting point to know where to troubleshoot to see if airflow is indeed off, uh, if there are changes in the system in terms of duct leakage, uh, coil bypass, uh, dirty blower wheels, um, uh, open filter slots, other things that will give you an idea of where to start troubleshooting so you can know when you make a change or an adjustment, you can, you can know when you make a change or adjustment that the, the system you did have impact on the measurement. Um, I did get a question here. Can, can attendees have the slides mailed to them afterwards? Sure, uh, we'll do that. Slides will be mailed. I'm making a note here. After the session this afternoon, uh, we'll mail the slides, a PDF of the slides off to you. You can also eliminate false causes. If you're looking to, to troubleshoot uh, an airflow issue, you believe that's the situation, uh, you may make an adjustment and be able to take a test and know that that did or did not have any impact on the system. And you also want to create a paper trail of your work. You want to know where you started. You want to have some data when you come and examine the system again, or perhaps when you uh, get help from a, from a colleague. It, it does also help you to get better factory support, we found. Uh, that the manufacturers do want to listen to people that are actually following their inst installation instructions and do have a good grasp of the basic fundamentals. Uh, they're going to be more interested in dealing with you because especially when you're dealing with uh, telephone factory support, um, they're going to need to know some parameters about how the system's running beyond just that it doesn't work. And for a lot of contractors and technicians, it'll just help them sleep better at night knowing they've done everything they possibly could and they delivered a very high quality service. And when we talk about getting those accurate measurements, it's not just one thing. It's really the only thing. Um, there there are, are many steps to taking an airflow measurement, and there could be uh, small errors can creep in. So that's why it's very uh, important to follow a particular measuring process, to repeat the same steps, to make sure that the probe that you're using, you understand how it's supposed to be positioned, that you're careful about calculation errors. The handy thing is when the manufacturers build in calculations, you don't have to worry so much about that. Uh, you do trust that they have those calculations correct, so that can remove, if you have a calculating anemometer, that can remove some of that, uh, one of those overhead details you have to pay attention to. Uh, not factoring in air density, we'll be talking about the impact of air density here shortly. Um, just using improper techniques and not having enough practice with the system, or understanding the limits of uh, measurement and a resolution for the for the devices or the steps uh, the, the types of uh, airflow measurements you're taking so we wanted to emphasize here you know, true tech tools our, our tagline is making measurement science work it, it really is science it's uh, it's physics um, I heard someone say at a, a session a couple weeks ago it's physics don't blame me that's just the way it is uh, if you don't like it, that's just the way it is. It's science. Um, air conditioning, the whole science of it's made up of repeatable, universal, well-proven, and really understandable and self-provable facts. Uh, there are things you can do with the science of air conditioning uh, once you understand some basics of it, and that's what we're trying to impart by doing sessions like these. And usually measurements are made to prove facts. You want to see where the system is, how things are running, how things are adjusted. And this is just one of my favorite slides here where we talk about uh, atomic theory where there's things you really, it's harder to measure and categorize and we have the electron, the neutron, the proton, and the futon all rotating around the, uh, the central core here, the nucleus. That was meant to be funny so you can all laugh right now. When we talk about airflow and setting it, um, we, we did mention this before about the nominal 400 CFM per ton. And it's critical how critical it is to system performance, and that it has that in order to set refrigerant charge 
proper airflow must be first set. And when you're talking about uh, um, a heating system, a furnace, you would set it in the middle of the temperature rise range for furnaces. But in, in most cases, you do want to refer to the manufacturer's specifications or their installation instructions to know uh, where, where things need to be set. And once you get the airflow set correctly for your load, you're really not supposed to adjust it to change the system characteristics. That's not what you're going to change, adjust. Uh, you may have a load issue, uh, that, that may be, but uh, you're not going to be changing the airflow once it's set to one of these parameters. Now, we're, we're stressing the accuracy of the measurement. If you don't get an accurate velocity measurement, then, you, then that, that plays into an inaccurate CFM measurement, and you're trying to use CFM as one of the parameters you're trying to measure. So I want to go over some of those issues that do affect accuracy. There's density, air density. We talked about air having a specific density, and if you recall back, we're talking about at 0% humidity and at sea level, and also at uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. How often are we running at a humidity different than 0%? I, I would venture to say all the time. How often is you, are you running an air conditioning or heating system at a temperature different than 70 degrees? Most of the time because the system is meant to either cool or heat above that, the air above that. And how often are you running at any place above sea level? Uh, in fact, I've got a, a friend of ours at True Tech who's offered to do some testing in uh, the Colorado mountains uh, to actually help us demonstrate how the effect of density correction is important to airflow. So summing all this up, you can, it, you can affect or, or have an impact of about 10% if you don't get the density corrected when you're measuring airflow. If you use a standard means of measuring it that doesn't correct or account for density, you can throw in an error of 10%, as well as the accuracy of the airflow measurement of about plus or minus 5%. So the proper technique is required. Just the way you use the measuring technique and having accurate sensors, accurate enough for the purpose for which you can do. If you can only adjust the blower speed uh, in two or three or four different steps, uh, and have, you have a super accurate method that leads you with, uh, within a five or you know, four or five uh, feet per minute measurement or you know, just several CFM, they may be too accurate for, your, for what you can do with the number. So you need to know what kind of number you're looking for and what's important in the range of the number, the tolerance or accuracy. So we're not always saying use the super accurate equipment, but use the appropriate level of accuracy for the kind of testing you're doing. So why density really matters, and we talked about that error, the um, errors in density, how it can impact things. If the density is low, you're going to need more CFM or more mass of air required to keep the mass flow rate the same. Uh, if, the, if the air has less density, that means it has less mass, it has less ability to carry that energy transfer or the heat transfer in it. So you're going to need more of it to keep the mass flow rate, to keep the system running correctly the same. And the interesting point, if air density is not considered, if you're ignoring or using methods that do not consider air density, many systems will have low airflow. And what did we just say in the other uh, slide a few slides ago? 70% of systems have low airflow. So I'd say one of the things to pay attention to then is air density. That can help us keep out of that factor where systems have too low an airflow. But we call this the, the beauty of the fan. Uh, the fan actually moves a fixed volume regardless of the air density. So if the, the fan is moving 3,000 feet per minute at 70 degrees, it's basically a volume pump that's also going to move 3,000 CFM at 250 degrees. So if a fan can be used to move air at a specific volume flow rate, then it can also be used in reverse. A vane anemometer can be used to measure airflow independent of the air density. So there, there are many ways to measure airflow, and we're going to cover uh, basically as many as we could think of here we're going to put uh, we're going to put forth on this slide and a lot of them we consider as indirect measurements and I'll, I'll go through why we consider each one of these as indirect measurements of airflow wind chill basically you can lick your hand or lick your finger or use a hot wire anemometer they all operate in the same principle of wind chill however it uh, it really is looking for the heat transfer away from 
the surface, your finger or the hot wire, based upon the air velocity. And that heat transfer is going to be based upon how dense the air is. So this is a density-dependent method based upon heat transfer. It's not actually measuring the airflow, but it's measuring the impact or the effect of airflow, the cooling uh, process of airflow. Temperaturized method, that's often used in a, in a, a furnace or a residential furnace system for setup, uh, for airflow setup with a known heat input. Um, that's only as good as the, the way it was calibrated in the lab, the manufacturer, and the amount of detail that's given there. So that, that has to be something that's taken into consideration, the manufacturer's input. Static pressure drop. Uh, that's often used to estimate or to, to quote-unquote, measure airflow. But that's basically using the pressure drop over a known restriction. And usually the restrictions is the heat exchanger or the air conditioning coil or a combination of both of them. Uh, and these are numbers that the manufacturer gives you based upon you know, good, solid lab test data that they've done. And we'll go into this in, in detail in a moment. But that um, known restriction can change. If it's an air conditioning coil and the coil is wet, how wet is wet? If the, uh, the coil gets dirty and gets contaminated, that can also restrict it and change the airflow. Um, pedostatic or a pedo tube, either using a pedo tube arrays or grids, those, those are all different ways of measuring airflow. Um, these, these are based upon impact pressure measurements and differential pressure measurements. So they all are based upon pressure, and the pressure of air changes actually with the density of the air. Uh, it's, the, the analogy there is thinking about an air, uh, a small volume of air, uh, like a tennis ball or a marshmallow. Which one's going to hurt thrown at the same velocity? the one that has more mass, it's going to have more impact, it's going to create more pressure. So air, when it has higher density, will um, increase in pressure, the amount of uh, the, the pedostatic uh, pressure, and that will cause a difference in reading. So again, this is a density-dependent method. Uh, capture devices, hoods, bags, uh, powered or, or uh, active uh, capture devices, uh, Basically, the capture devices are also using some type of either thermal or hot wire anemometer or using a, a pitot tube or a grid or an array. So they can have the same uh, flow hoods, can have the same impact on density. Some of them do have density correction that you can build into them. Uh, there are powered capture devices like the Flow Blaster, and there's a new product by Retrotech also uh, that can also be used. And these, uh, the powered devices, do remove any kind of uh, back pressure impact, but they still have to be corrected for density. So they are uh, higher resolution, higher accuracy means, but still need to have density correction. And then there's direct measurements. We consider the rotating vane, like we talked about before, because the fan moves a constant CFM for, of air. The rotating vane measures a constant CFM per air of air, independent, basically independent of velocity. So if we talk about making measurements in uh, duct systems next, the temperature rise method can be used for making a, a measurement in the, the duct system by looking for the heat rise over a known, uh, a known energy coil. The pitot tube can be used. And again, we're going to get into these details, and we're just categorizing them as induct measurements. The thermal or hot wire anemometer can be used for induct. The Wilson flow grid or the true flow grid, which is an energy conservatory product, can be used for measuring uh, induct airflow, total system airflow, and pressure drops. Uh, we talked about that just a moment ago. And that is uh, really stressed, provided there's a CFM or lookup chart, because every different piece of equipment is going to have a slightly different uh, pressure drop across the filters, coils, or heat exchangers. Uh, so that needs to be something that's known specific to the equipment. So we talked about measuring induct systems. These are some of the, the uh, basically the five methods that are used for measuring induct. Um, there's also a, a, a mini, mini rotating vane, uh, which we skipped over in the chart here, but that is also another way of uh, measuring induct. And then temperature, um, or excuse me, measuring techniques for measuring at terminals across things like this very nice uh, fancy looking grill here. There's a flow hood or capture hood can be used for measuring terminal flow on uh, supplies or returns. Uh, pitot tubes can also be used. 
In the case of a pitot tube, you'd have to scan across the front of the array and keep the tube pointed in the direction of the airstream and be taking average measurements of velocity the whole time and then converting those average velocity measurements into CFM, again, by knowing the, uh, the open area of this grill. The thermal anemometer hot wire can also be used at terminals, and that would be their supplies or returns. And again, traversing it or following a pattern, going across to intercept all the different places of airflow and averaging it. And a rotating vane anemometer, which we're going to cover in detail how those are used, all these are used, uh, but that can be used again to scan across, to traverse and average. And the, the meter in that case has its own, uh, as do some of the pitot tube and the thermal meters have an averaging function built in. And then there's a flow blaster, which can be used to uh, uh, to measure uh, pressure compensated um, airflow. So let's dig into, um, someone asked about if I'd covered how do we determine air density. We didn't get into it in detail. Um, I can add, I'll add something on uh, determining air density to the uh, the handout pack. Just making a note here. Um, I'll put together a little a slide on that. We'll add it to the handout pack and we'll put it in as a slide. That's not a slide I prepared here, but I can do that afterwards. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about one of the first methods here is the hot wire or the thermal anemometer. And just to get into a little bit of how this works to help you better understand how to use it. The thermal anemometer sees the airflow in the direction of this uh, this V, this line moving into it. And it's a hot wire strung between two posts. It's either a platinum or a tungsten wire. And that wire is going to be chilled by the air velocity going over it. And that chilling is going to require a different amount of current to maintain the temperature of that wire. So thermal anemometers tend to use up, um, Newer ones are better and better, but they tend to use up batteries a little faster than other means of measuring air velocity because they actually heat up this little filament in here, make it hot. That's why they're called hot wire. And then a temperature sensor below it reads the temperature of the hot wire. And as the air flows across it, it chills or cools the wire. It has to add more current, and that current is proportional to the air velocity. So these are all calibrated. Manufacturers do a fantastic job of calibrating and adjusting these to give you good air velocity readings. However, we did talk about the fact that these do have, um, it depends upon the mass of air flowing over here, so the density, the air density is important to know. So this is basically the wind chill over heated bead and it's proportional to the air velocity, and that's how it's displayed on the screen of the meter. Some of the benefits of using a measurement like this, uh, it has a fairly broad range uh, from very low velocities to very high velocities. They're easy to use to position. Just want to make sure that your probe, if it has a mark on it to point into the airstream, you, you point it the same way every time. That's the direction it was calibrated in the wind tunnel when the manufacturer calibrated it. You want to make sure it's uh, used that direction. Uh, some of the limitations, uh, denser air has more mass, which is going to cause it to uh, show a little bit higher velocity because it's uh, uh, move, moving the air, the uh, the, the uh, heat away from the bead at a faster rate when it's denser air. They can also be subject to contamination. So if you imagine if this got a little fuzz or wool or oil on it, that that's going to change how it dissipates heat. If that changes, it gets contaminated, or uh, it would change how it uh, uh, impacts the the correctness of the measurement for velocity flow. It also impacts. This is a highly magnified drawing here. Usually the um, the hot wire is a bead, and the bead is smaller than the, the period on about 10, uh, 10 point font type. So that's a very small dot. And if the airflow is very turbulent or chaotic around it, you're going to have to take a lot of measurements when you do that traverse across the grill like we showed before. You've got to take a lot of measurements in that. Um, however, this is part of a capture hood. Built into a capture hood, a capture hood pulls in all the air from every direction and moves it across the hot wire array. And in that case, it's got a controlled amount of air going over a known area, so it's a, it's a little bit more stable. But just using a bare hot wire anemometer, um, recognize the fact that there's um, it's going to only be in, intercepting a small amount of the area of the air that's flowing over it. 
And again, we talked about it being used as induct measurements primarily. Uh, it can be used at supplies and returns, but again, if there's a lot of turbulence at the supplies or returns, and this is built mostly on supplies, you're going to have to um, account for the fact of taking a lot of measurements in order to account for all the, the changes in airflow coming out of a supply. Now I'll talk a little bit about a pitot tube and how this works. A pitot tube is basically a tube in a tube. Um, most of the time we're dealing with L-shaped -shape, L pitot tubes, although there are straight tubes. We're not going to cover those in, in this session here. The center tube in the pitot tube sees the entire pressure of the airflow. And it's a combination of two things. It's the velocity pressure plus the static pressure equals the total pressure. That's everything, all the pressure due to the air moving into the tube and impacting it, impacting the pressure sensor, plus the static pressure in the duct, which is also going to be pushing on this. The two of them added together, velocity plus static equals the total pressure. So the center part of the tube is going to be seeing total pressure. The part of the tube that has holes facing 90 degrees or perpendicular to the airflow, that's why it's important to orient this correctly. These, this part of the tube, which sees the static pressure or the balloon pressure in the duct, will be imposed, come down through the outer tube, and then be connected to the negative side of the, um, of the pressure meter, the anemometer. The difference between total and static is velocity pressure. So you can then determine exactly what the velocity pressure is. So it's based upon impact pressure. And as we talked about before, the marsh, marshmallows versus tennis balls, the higher density items like the tennis balls, the higher density air is going to cause a, a slightly higher pressure. So it is going to make it air density dependent. It's pretty cost effective. Uh, pitot tubes can be had for uh, under 100 bucks. A uh, very good digital anemometer, well under 200 bucks. So for less than 300 bucks, you can have a pretty pretty good airflow measurement technique. Um, I didn't mention before, but the hot wire anemometers, those are in the uh, good ones are in the 400 to 600 dollar range. Uh, so a pitot tube uses the pressure meter. You have to combine the two together. Um, those are pretty cost effective, easy to use method for measuring airflow. The limitations of this method, uh, denser air has more mass. We talked about that. So there's more pressure at the same velocity. And the low pressure doesn't generate enough differential pressure unless you have a precision anemometer. And precision anemometers, you move out of that $200 price range into like the five to $800 or $900 range for precision anemometer at low velocities. So these are better set for medium to high velocities. And again, the best way to use this is an induct measurement. It can be used at supplies or returns, but you do have to take an awful lot of measurements in order to get an idea of what's happening across the surface of the, of the uh, supply or return grill. The true flow plate is basically a pitot tube array. Or you can think of it as a, a combination of many pitot tubes going across the face of this grid. Uh, the, the, the true flow plate uh, inserts in the filter slot of an air handler system. So it's like multiple pitot tubes are put in there all at once, yielding an average velocity that you use your uh, manometer, hook your, to your manometer, to determine what the actual um, air, air flow rate is. It's pretty fast to set up. You pull the air filter out. Uh, you adjust it to the right size, slip it in the slot. It can be used in a central return to cover a central return or in a filter slot if you want to do the total system airflow. Um, however, the limitations are the same as a pitot tube uh, in terms of uh, density uh, and making sure it's uh, uh, installed and oriented correctly. It's not exactly the same as runtime conditions. In other words, when you're running a system with a filter in there, it has a certain pressure drop. And unless the true flow grid exactly matches that pressure drop, you're going to be a little bit off from the pressure drop and impacting the airflow somewhat in either a positive or negative direction from the filter that used to be in there because this replaces the filter. However, it does a pretty good job of approximating that um, the filter pressure drop. Hang on one second, please. You also do need to have a digital manometer, 
in order to uh, to get the reading, extract the pressure reading out of it, and set your setting on the digital manometer to true flow grid. And it will actually give you the output in um, in CFM because it in this case it already knows the area, so it knows how big the area it is it's measuring, and it will give you the velocity at uh, across this area, and then actually give you the CFM. It's important to note that the um, the other ones are giving you velocity measurements only, and you have will have to do or uh, input the calculation to your meter to give you the CFM. And the application here would be system airflow. Um, it, it's going to do either a central return or a filter slot. Um, it's not really suitable to be used over individual supplies or multiple returns unless they pretty much, excuse me, pretty much match the uh, open area of the of the grid itself. And you do also need to have uh, some form of digital manometer hooked up to the TrueFlow grid. Uh, which would add to the uh, the total cost is around fifteen hundred to sixteen hundred dollars, and split about equally between the grid itself and the digital manometer. And two different ones are shown here. Precision digital manometers are shown. Let's delve into a little bit of the static pressure measurement because that seems to be a fairly popular one. Uh, it's usually pretty popular because it is a low cost. Uh, we're talking about static pressure tips, which are available, a pair of them for about 30 bucks, and some hose for about 10 bucks. So about $42 you can get a, a static pressure test kit. Um, in fact, that's exactly what we sell them for. Uh, and a digital manometer, a good digital manometer connected to it, can give you the difference in pressure, this difference in static pressure over a known resistance. That's how this uh, the system works. The static pressure uh, tip is basically half of a pitot tube, and that's uh, basically it, there's no uh, total pressure, so you don't know the velocity pressure in here. It only has the holes on the side, and the holes on the side tell it the balloon pressure or the static pressure in this part of the ductwork versus the static pressure in this part. So the difference between those two static pressures is going to be the static pressure drop across this known resistance. You do need to have a digital manometer and a couple static pressure tips. We're talking around 220 bucks here for this uh, type of arrangement. It's pretty easy to set up and use. You do need to uh, poke a hole in the duct and get the uh, static pressure tip uh, facing into the airstream to make sure it's reading only static pressure, um, that the balloon pressure that's around the tip. <clears throat> the um, the results though are dependent upon how detailed the manufacturer's tables are, uh, and it's got to be this known resistance is what the manufacturer tells you this resistance how it reacts when an airflow is across it. It will t the manufacturer will tell you how much pressure drop you see at that airflow, and this known resistance could change. The manufacturer may have in there that needs to be a wet coil, but then the question is how wet is wet, and if a wet coil is wet and dirty that could also impact the flow resistance and change your reading. If it changes your pressure reading, it could chart, put, put you in a different velocity lookup on the velocity table, which we'll show you next. You also have to be careful about the velocity drag at the walls of the ducts. You want to make sure that there's no insulation or nothing in between so that you are actually just sensing the overall static pressure at the, at the center of the duct. And you do need to be careful about drilling into things. You don't want to pop a coil uh, by inadvertently uh, drilling in and hitting an, uh, an A-coil when you're doing this type of work or, or limit switch or any kind of wiring or anything that may be inside the system. So you do have to have a little, uh, apply a little bit of caution when using this method. And this is definitely an induct measurement. You cannot do a static pressure test at the face of a supply or a return and get any kind of meaningful measurement out of it. So this is strictly limited to an induct measurement when you have a known resistance and we'll show you what that uh, resistance table looks like in just a second. Um, here's a, um, an example of measuring the external static pressure, uh, between, which is between the supply and the return. And this is the pressure the fan must operate against. Uh, and this is a good diagnostic. And we'll, I think we get into that a little bit more in, um, in session four when we talk about the capacity test. But the greater the pressure, the lesser the flow, the more resistance to flow there is. So this is a good diagnostic in determining what may be causing system problems, either on the supply restrictions or return restrictions. Um, this is just a little snapshot here of a uh, different, couple different kinds of pocket manometers or um, mini manometers. Um, 
they can be used, they have a variety of uses, as the, the point of this slide here is talking about, in addition to the airflow measurement with the pitot tube or the static pressure tip. You can also uh, switch into different units of measurement. They can also be used for fuel pressure, uh, checking pressure switches, and that kind of thing. Now we get into the, um, the measurement of total external static pressure and the, the kind of the steps on how we build up to this and, and get, a, get an airflow measurement out of it, a CFM measurement out of it. The airflow and CFM is actually measured by the manufacturer in a test stand. And the pressure drop across one of the components, usually heat exchanger or the evaporator coil, is also measured by the manufacturer. Now if they take the pressure drop and the CFM and they know those, you can, they can uh, then look across on the table and calculate a new CFM based upon the pressure drop. However, we, we do note that this is a, um, a system that can be used for estimating airflow um, if you don't have the manufacturer's literature uh, because all systems do not perform the same. They don't all have the same resistance. And, and a point to keep in mind for equipment design, Usually the total external static pressure that we illustrated before is a half of an inch of water column, although ranges from 0.3 to 1 are possible. And I've seen uh, some famous uh, test data that shows most systems are operating well in excess of a half an inch of water column, and uh, that may be part of the explanation why there are such so many airflow issues out there. And the thing to keep in mind, that too, is ECM, or electronically commutated motors, or the new uh, low-energy variable speed motors. They make this all a new ball game. Uh, that's a whole separate topic. There's some good uh, training and resources on that um, because they do operate based upon sensing the pressure in the system, um, sensing the torque on the motor itself, which is a, senses the back pressure. So they don't run the same. You can't use this as you would with the a PSC type motor. You can't use the same uh, diagnostic technique on an ECM as you can with a PSC. This is designed for PSC systems. So let's take a look at one manufacturer's airflow performance data right from their installation literature. Again, we talked about the fact you have to know what type of equipment it is. In this case, we're looking at a Model 21 or Dash 21 cabinet size. So it would be different for another type of equipment. So that's the main point here. Uh, you have to know whether it has uh, electric heaters or not because that's going to change the pressure drop in the system. You can see that pressure drop, external static pressure is changing here based upon um, the, the, or the, uh, the CFM is changing based upon pressure changes which are going to be impacted on what's inside the system. Um, you also have to know what speed the blower motor is set on. And then you can determine, if you, if you know you're using a, a Dash 21 cabinet with no electric heaters running at high speed at 230 volts, then you can look across here and say, what's my external static pressure? If it's half an inch of water column, I look down to that line where we had this line across here, half an inch water column. I have 1,205 CFM, the top number in the box. The center number in the box is the approximate watts that are being consumed at that speed of operation or 290 watts. And another point of interest might be the RPM or the speed of the motor. The motor's running at about 807 RPM. Now if you did some adjustments, changed some parameters, and you moved to a different external static pressure, you would have a, a difference in the, in the reading here where you move down to, say, uh, for example, 1201 CFM, or if you went down to 0.3 inches of water column, or up to 1,209 CFM. So that's how you use this kind of air, airflow performance chart from the manufacturer's literature. Now we'll take a step back here and look at um, total exter or external static pressure. It's, about the, it's the same kind of technique. Again, we've talked about measuring the pressure drop across a calibrated or reference resistance. In that last table, we had the reference measurement uh, from the manufacturer's literature back here. And we use that pressure difference. In this case, we have uh, plus point, 
three five inches of water column and minus point one five inches of water column. So the total is you subtract the two plus point three five minus a negative point one five, and you end up with a half an inch of water column is the uh, the, the drop in pressure the, the in the external static pressure. So that's how we use that uh, half inch before. But this is only as accurate, the measurement here is only as accurate as the reference measurement, and that reference measurement is air density dependent. Um, we talked about the fact that running a system at different temperatures, different humidities, different pressures are all going to change, uh, barometric pressures are going to change the readouts you get on the scale. So you have to be aware of that. And here's just an illustration, a quick uh, snapshot of measuring the pressure drop across the evaporator coil. And it can also be used for estimating airflow if you have that reference data about the airflow over the evaporator coil. And again, it will vary significantly if the coil is wet, and that should be explained if the manufacturer is talking about a, a wet coil when they do their, uh, their resistance measurement. And just as a diagnostic technique, uh, larger pressure, static pressure drops indicate restrictions, and usually it's due to um, maintenance issues, dirt or accumulation of pet hair or, or whatever in the system uh, that can really restrict the airflow in uh, coils, the A coils, uh, filter systems, or the secondary, especially the secondary, but even, uh, the, and even sometimes the primary heat exchanger if it's bad enough. So we're, we're really focusing in on the, uh, the static pressure measurements because that does seem to be a, a basic diagnostic that's uh, affordable and reachable by many people. Um, so we're talking about where to make a measurement uh, with a static pressure drop. Uh, you can use do it in gas and furnaces and split uh, AC systems measuring before the, flower, the blower and after the furnace. In a package unit, measure from the return to the supply plenum in a split heat pump before the coil to after the blower, and including any kind of resistive heating strips. And then there's the interpretation of the, the static pressure measurement in the field, um, where about a half an inch of water column is a normal operating stamp, uh, pressure point for the ESP test, the field. And it's really hard to nail down that exact airflow because it's the most of the tables you won't find are density corrected. Uh, so you're going to have, and if you have uh, significant changes in static pressure, it's going to change, it's going to vary quite greatly the amount of um, the CFM that's flowing through the system. But it's, it is able to tell you the extent of the problem, uh, how bad it is, and maybe and perhaps on which side the return of the supply the problem is. We showed before we had the 0.35 versus the 0.15 on the other side. Now we'll move into vein anemometers and move on to new measuring technology, a new one on our list. Basically, there's a propeller, which rotates in proportion to the speed of the air. Again, these are, are calibrated in uh, wind tunnels. This happens to be 100 millimeters, or about 4 inches in diameter propeller. Um, this particular model of uh, propeller here uh, has a sealed um, wheel on the edge, and that sealed wheel keeps the veins all in one direction and allows no slip or bypass flow beyond the, the propeller edge. This is a Testo 417, for example. And there are also mini veins, and this is an exploded view. This is about uh, the size of your thumb, this whole tip here, about 5 eighths of an inch. This is a mini vein, and this mini vein can uh, is used for induct measurement, whereas the, uh, the larger veins are used for um, measurements at supplies and returns. Um, I did get a question about uh, mailing the slides uh, from part one and part two, and I'll do that. I'll go back through the list of people at part two and make sure everybody um, gets a copy of slides from part one and part two. Thanks for the question, Bruce. Bruce, excuse me one second. The uh, vane anemometer, uh, the propeller is rotating in proportion to the airspeed. And, and the, uh, 
that's basically the principle of operation here. Uh, the benefit is there's really no need for density correction. Uh, there's, there's small to negligible amounts of uh, impact change in the density, the air density through this. So it will measure CFM directly uh, without need for density correction. And in the case of the vein anemometers, it's measuring over a larger area than, for example, the pitot tube would be. Uh, that pitot tube I showed in the screen, the, the uh, access point at the tip of the pitot tube uh, is is perhaps um, uh, less than well less than a tenth of an inch in diameter, whereas this is measuring about four inches, and this is measuring a half an inch in diameter, uh, and the hot wire anemometer about the you know the size of a dot of a period. So these are taking into account some of the the changes, the variety of, of velocities that are impacting the uh, the airflow, and then averaging them all together, the same as the uh, the mini vein inside the duct. So they're averaging over a larger area than some of the other measurement methods. They're also minimally invasive. It's, uh, it's unlike, uh, say, a capture hood, which may induce or cause back pressure in a system. Uh, the, uh, the veins basically let the air flow straight through them, especially at supplies or returns. And this has very low impact, the, uh, the mini vein, uh, because it is a tapered and contoured probe. It has very low impact inside the duct, so it doesn't cause any kind of pressure upsets or changes. The limitations on these are turbulence. You want to make sure that uh, there isn't an excessive amount of turbulence, especially if uh, the output's coming directly off a fan and you have rotating flow, because that rotating flow will actually accelerate the veins and throw throw off the vein reading in a vein anemometer. So you want to make sure that the, the turbulence is uh, basically a flat flow or straight flow into it, but no rotating flow into either the uh, either of the veins, and that would come by um, avoiding placing them too direct, uh, too close to where uh, the spinning flow may be coming off of a fan, rotating flow off of a fan. You also have to be careful about the angular orientation. Basically, are these facing flat into the wind? Um, however, if, even if you are only, if you're off about 10% on the angular orientation, or you'll only get about a 1% error in the reading. So they do have some uh, their own capacity to correct and self-adjust for that or, or be tolerant to that kind of uh, miss, uh, miss uh, pointing of the, of the face of the device. The easiest way with any of these measuring uh, techniques to tell if you've got your probe positioned correctly is to rotate it, is to move it around to make sure that you're intercepting the flow straight on, the stroke, the flow coming straight on into the device. So in this case, the airflow would be coming straight into the uh, propeller head or from this direction. Uh, actually, they both operate in either direction, although there is a preferred direction for the, uh, the mini vein. It's got a little dot printed on it. That's the direction which you should send the flow into that, that vein. Some of the other limitations are um, friction of the propeller, um, but these uh, very low startup torques, uh, particular models, but it's something to look for when you're picking a vein anemometer. Make sure it has a really low startup torque. And then the impact of air rotation, which we just mentioned. The key applications for these for the large vein are in at the face of supplies and returns. And that would be especially true for flex duct systems because otherwise a flex duct system is really difficult to measure uh, total airflow. And the mini vein is in ducts uh, on hard duct systems. Um, flex ducts again, you really uh, you got to go to the terminals, unfortunately, to uh, to measure supplies and returns. So when you're measuring air velocity for a balancing, if you're doing a basic balance, you have uh, with with a vein anemometer or any kind of anemometer, you, you measure the velocity of air that's leaving each register. And this would be on a supply side. And you're looking for a face velocity uh, not to exceed 700 feet per minute because that usually causes some noise issues uh, with uh, the people that are occupying the space. But usually the face velocities are in the 400 to 600 feet per minute range, which uh, achieves the correct amount of mixing because that's it's an even more advanced topic. But um, you're basically using uh, the airflow to change the conditions in the room, so you do need to have enough air velocity to sweep and wash and mix in the room. So if the duct system is designed properly, and in in delivering uh, an equal amount of air, or the correct amount of air to every room in, that's on the system, that's on the trunk line, uh, you can use the velocity to balance 
the system. You don't have to go through and calculate the CFM. But if the duct system is not designed correctly, which unfortunately is many times the case, um, you really can't use a velocity balancing method. You're going to have to understand the load, the amount of CFM you need in each room, and then actually measure and calculate the CFM. So that is possible. It's kind of a shortcut technique, uh, but th that's only if the system is designed properly uh, to bring the right amount of conditioned air to the space. Uh, and then there's also a technique where if you use the mini vane to measure the airflow inside the duct and you can get access just to one terminal to measure the amount of airflow at the register with the large vane or the sum of all the airflows at the register is a large vane and they're all the same um, grills on, on the supplies, you can then calculate the K factor. So um, that's that's a process you can use by knowing how much is in the duct, what the duct flow is, and then knowing how much is actually getting out of the duct and assuming no duct leakage and the same grill across each uh, supply, you can then calculate the K factor of the register. And this is just a photograph of proportional balancing of a system that's uh, being done with the, with the 417, the, the large vein rotating anemometer from Testo. And these run about 450 bucks. So the technique here would be to start with the register that has the highest airflow and work room by room to proportional balance the system uh, to make sure the airflows are all proportional to the loads in the rooms. And again, we talked about the typical face velocity and uh, what the velocity should be on the return. Use a little bit slower flow on the return side. An important uh, point to cover are uh, scoops, mini hoods, flow funnels, uh, things like that. In this case, we're showing one uh, from a Testo 417, their, their little scoop. Um, these are really not meant to be used with volume flows above about 75 CFM. Otherwise, you're going to be causing back pressure in the system. And that back pressure is going to muffle or throttle or limit the flow out that supply. So these are designed to be used with low flows, flows below 75 cubic feet per minute. If you use them on flows higher than that, you're not really measuring the airflow. You're smothering the duct and then measuring the airflow. And that would lead you to a smothered duct measurement, which isn't what you're interested in. So these, you have to be very careful when using these that you stay below 75 CFM. They may look like a flow hood, but they are not a flow hood. Jumping over to uh, where to make measurements in an induct system, uh, we're showing one of the uh, one of the labs that we have access to, um, basically an installed unit, and you're looking for a straight section of duct when you have a hard duct system that's about two to three duct diameters away from any turns or any kind of fittings. So you want basically a straight run where the flow is developed and maintained an even profile, and it'd be ideal in a traditionally ducted system a hard duct system to measure at three points going across the uh, the duct system right here. If if you try to um, measure on one, it's not going to be as accurate as measuring three and then taking the average airflow. And in this case, you can use uh, you know, any of the in-duct measuring tools like the hot wire anemometer, the pitot tube, or the mini vane, the rotating mini vane. Um, you cannot do a static pressure test test here and get any kind of measurement out of this. That'll that'll tell you what the static pressure is at that point in the duct, but it does not tell you. There's no way of calculating the airflow from that. So just be aware of uh, the measurement you're taking and how you use it. So using the mini vane, uh, again, we're kind of fans of this uh, measurement technique. It's really pretty non-invasive because of the tapering of the head. It's got really excellent repeatability if you use it properly. It's pretty forgiving to operator error when you tip or rotate the head of the probe. But then again, you can try to find that maximum velocity, the streamline that you're reading, by putting the probe in and rotating it left to right and then keeping it in that position. And then you've intercepted the, the main line of flow. However, if you're using a straight duct system, you're talking about parallel to the, to the long axis of the duct. Uh, that's where you'd be measuring. That's where the general flow line is going to be running. So we say you can get an airflow measurement here in under three minutes in a duct. Um, there's a, a way of taking averages with the device, which we're not going to go into today. We could explain that to you or, or check on our resource page on our website for the 416. 
uh, or on our YouTube channel where we have some videos on that. And we talk about the minimal impact of the uh, small probe and the ultra low mass rotating vein and the ex excellent durability chemical and kid resistance. The kid resistance comes from the fact uh, Jim, my business partner, teaches in a, in a secondary school lab and he's had really good, uh, good uh, success with uh, kids respecting these tools. And again, one major point, no error density correction required because it is a, a vein measurement which eliminates or nearly eliminates the impact of density changes. Let's move now into uh, capture devices. And we're running at uh, probably going to run about five minutes over by the time I get through this. Um, it's about 3.07 Eastern right now, and I'll probably be finishing up around 3.20. Uh, capture devices, you could use a plastic bag. Um, it's cheap. It's accurate. Use a stopwatch. Fill up the bag. You know how much volume is in the bag. But we're not sure about how accurate it is. Uh, because you do have to avoid pressurizing the bag because just like a uh, smothering effect from those scoops or those little mini flow hoods, so-called flow hoods, uh, that's going to change the amount of airflow coming in if you cover and uh, you swamp the, uh, you, you cover and choke down the duct flow. Uh, repeatability uh, with a stopwatch, I don't know, you probably need two people, one to hold the stopwatch, one to hold the bag. I'm not sure this is a way that uh, most people are going to want to use to measure airflow. But we do have to mention it because it is out there and being used in some cases. <clears throat> flow hoods, that's another a great measurement uh, technique. Um, this is one of the manufacturers. Basically, there's either a pitot tube or a hot wire, a thermal anemometer array inside here. And this is across a known area. So, you know, a light bulb should be going off in your head right now. The known cross-sectional area is already known. Anything that comes through this throat is going to go through a known area. So the device is already smart enough to know how big its area is. And it has an array in here. And the array is what the it takes the measurements over multiple points. So sort of like the Wilson or the TrueFlow grid, it's already taking an average across and uh, factoring out some of the variations in velocity measurement coming to it. It knows its own area. It knows the velocity. It's taking an average velocity. And on top of that, it provides uh, some flow straightening or correction as the flow goes into here to make it all come in perpendicular. And there even is, there are some um, models that have flow straighteners that can be popped in, uh, which will serve to further straighten out the flow and improve the measurement. So all you have to do, in the friend's, uh, words of my friend Rob Falk, is you put it up and mash the button. Uh, just put up against to make sure you, you entirely cover the supplier return and then push the button, and the reading will show up as to what the CFM is. Uh, so it's a very uh, fast and accurate way of taking uh, very quick and accurate uh, CFM measurements. Um, you do have to be cautious of uh, density correction because it is using a thermal or uh, pitot tube pressure array or thermal array, and both of those can be impacted by significant changes in air density. Um, but it is uh, quick and easy and accurate. And these run anywhere a low flow barometer is around uh, $1,600. And the ones that have a larger range up to 2,500 CFM, they can run around uh, $2,900. Um, question I have, can an airflow hood be used outdoors uh, to measure, I guess it would be terminals, uh, terminal uh, velocity from uh, an exhaust fan? Uh, I don't see why not. Um, as long as there wasn't a significant amount of wind because the wind pressure could affect the pressure at the throat here uh, and actually cause some Bernoulli effect or change the way air flows through the system. Uh, but I don't, and, and as long as the seal could be made to seal against whatever the outdoor surface is, uh, I don't believe there's any reason why an airflow hood couldn't be used outdoors. And we talked about the measurement technique uh, based on pitot or hot wire, so you can see how we're building on the technologies here and making more of a complete system package. The benefits to this uh, capture devices are pretty fast to set up, uh, pretty easy to use. And this is a pretty crazy slide here, um, just doing whatever it wants. Uh, however, the accuracy is mass dependent. i got to make note to fix that slide. Okay, 
sorry for the delay there, folks. I know I'm being recorded right now. So the, the variety of flow hoods you have out there, you can use PETA static. Um, they do, do give you a fast one-person snapshot operation. Uh, there's Short Ridge, Elnor, uh, TSI, uh, Canamax has one now. There's some from uh, the UK. Uh, they are multifunctional, many of them. You can snap out the measuring device, the thermal or the pressure uh, manometer, uh, and then use it for other types of measurement. Uh, so in this case, you have the digital manometer, which pops out, and sometimes you can add in temperature, velocity matrix, or relative humidity probes to get a number of different uh, types of readings. Uh, this is usually for the balancing professional. Um, in many cases, they can be back pressure compensated uh, through either uh, sorts of uh, flaps or other, other means to uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, at high flows, they're not going to induce any kind of back pressure or smothering effect. And they do, do have multiple sizes of, uh, for velocity sizes, like the low flow or the high flow types, and uh, different hood arrangements that, um, that can cover the correct, uh, cover correctly the ducts. But basically, the multiple sizes are 500 and 2500 CFM. So now we'll jump to a, a new product that was launched. Um, actually, it was launched the uh, first time in public uh, a year ago, March. So that was March 2011. And this is made by the Energy Conservatory uh, up in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. It's a product called the Flow Blaster. Um, basically, the Flow Blaster is Everything you see above this line I'm drawing here, everything above, uh, it does use a duct blaster. Uh, so their product's called a duct blaster, which is the uh, airflow measuring device for duct pressure, uh, duct leakage pressure, which comes with a manometer. And then the flow blaster, blaster is an accessory that sits on top. It includes a grill skirt um, and a measurement array. The digital manometer um, and fan controller, I believe, come with the duct blaster. You also get a battery pack with it too, uh, so that you can use this as a portable means of going around grill to grill, uh, supply or return, and measuring the flow and using this fan to auto compensate the back pressure. So any smothering effect that you have, or in the terms of uh, LBL lab, that uh, they call insertion loss, uh, any type of loss of airflow caused by the fact you're inserting this over the air terminal, the air grill, can be compensated for by the fan. Uh, it can begin to pull and correct and neutralize the pressure under this hood. And when it does so, it normalizes the flow, and then you get a flow reading out of the device. So this is a pretty nifty device, uh, pretty darn accurate. I think the studies are showing phenomenal accuracy for it. Um, it ends up uh, running in around the just under $3,000 price range. Um, and so for any of these products you saw on this point, we do sell at True Tech Tools. You can just give us a call afterwards or send us an email, let us know. I would be happy to help uh, set you up with this equipment. Um, but uh, just to show you kind of the full array, this is, a, this is really kind of the top of the line measurement for, uh, for measuring your flow. Um, compared to regular flow hood, yes, it is more accurate than compared to regular flow hood because it uh, self-compensates, it auto-adjusts for any kind of insertion loss on a regular flow hood. Uh, regular flow hoods can be used to uh, a fairly good degree of accuracy, but this takes it to another level. Uh, how heavy is it? Um, I believe it's about the same weight as a regular flow hood. I'd have to check on that. And then um, recently this year I've shown a uh, powered flow hood uh, from Retrotech. Uh, and what they've developed is basically an accessory for any brand of duct leakage tester where instead of coupling it to the device with the battery pack, you, you basically use their uh, their duct leakage tester, which is a model DU200, which we sell, uh, and their um, a digital manometer, so that and a, a the piece of flex duct that comes with it connects to this alternate uh, terminal, and that terminal can be used and placed over any supply or return on the pressure line feeding back to the device. Uh, it helps to figure out how to neutralize it, and this uh, less expensive accessory, uh, which you do need to have. Um, it, it will only measure up to 7, 650 CFM, but as we talked about before, most uh, residential terminal flow for supplies, you want to keep it below 700 anyway. Uh, but it will measure up to 650 CFM, supplier return, pressure compensated, and produce a, a really refined uh, measurement. So you would add this to uh, their system. Um, zip holes here shown in this situation where they're doing an office measurement are not included. 
It's only another 30 bucks. Um, with this device, this uh, powered flow hood adapter accessory uh, could still be used as a pressure pan for those of you doing any kind of uh, energy diagnostics. Um, that's, uh, that's the sum of what I wanted to cover today. I uh, apologize for going a couple minutes over. Uh, but if you want any more information, uh, you can uh, give us a call at our toll-free number there, 888-224-3437. Uh, go to our website, uh, especially go to our training page where we have a lot of training materials. Uh, you can also see the links to the webinars if you want to sign up for Part 3 on refrigerant charge or Part 4 on capacity testing, uh, respectively, on July 5th and July 12th. Uh, so that's the remaining parts of the AC performance series. Um, so I want to thank you for your attendance today and your questions, and I will follow up with those materials. As I mentioned, we'll post the slides and get them mailed out to you. And uh, if you want to give me an email, shoot me an email. It's bill at truetechtools.com. Uh, or if you want to send one to Jim, uh, send it now to Jim Bergman with two N's, the number three, at gmail.com. So Jim's using that address at this point. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation, and we look forward to hearing back from you and appreciate your attending. Bye.